So the next question we want to think about is, what does the empirical evidence say about collusion? What does the data say? Now, this is a problem because mm, we don't necessarily know about all cartels, right? So often what happens is we'll find out about a cartel uh, after it gets broken up, and then we go back and look at um, you know price and output data. And, and what that data says is that a perfect cartel, a cartel that really gets to that monopoly level profit, uh, doesn't usually exist. But that doesn't mean that they aren't successful. Um, and so, you know, Griffin looked at 54 international cartels and found that prices uh, were marked up by about 45%. So that's profit. That's that's good for those firms, uh, not so good for the consumers. Um, in the graphite electrode market in the U.S., Levenstein and Suslow found that prices were uh, over 50% higher during the cartel period. Um, and Connor and Land in 2005 found, they looked at 200 cartel studies and found that international cartels that you know, expanded multiple countries um, increased prices by on average 32%. Um, and domestic cartels that were within a country raised prices by 18%. So these cartels are successful in terms of raising prices and therefore profits uh, for their member firms. In terms of stability, it's a little bit less clear. So Levenstein and Suslow looked at 50 cartel cases, and they found that they lasted by about 5.4 years. Um, a lot of those ended by uh, cheating. Um, so cheating meaning that one of the firms within the cartel uh, either lowers prices or increases output more than they're supposed to. Um, but, you know, a, co a company like De Beers, which is a diamond cartel, um, you know, globally has lasted for over 100 years. Um, despite, you know, firms trying to enter and disrupt uh, its monopoly. And entry is another way that cartels are often um, undermined. So um, that Levenstein and Suslow article found that entry was the most common cause of cartel breakdown. Um, and um, Simonian, des mm -hmm, that happened. Uh, found that collusion is more likely in markets with high natural barriers to entry, right, which we've already talked about, and uh, that makes a fair amount of sense. So the level of industry concentration also matters, right? So the more concentrated the fewer firms are, the collusion is going to be um, more likely to be successful. Um, and so Frost and Greer found that the median number of firms involved in a cartel was eight. Um, and Levenstein and Suslow again found that cartels uh, were in industries that tended to be more concentrated. Um, also, there's the question of, you know, is it a homogenous product or a heterogeneous product, and is demand stable? And so we already talked about if demand is fluctuating, it's hard to tell if uh, firms are cheating. And obviously, differentiated products make it more difficult to um, collude as well because it, it's unclear whether, you know, what the prices should be. Um, so these are three um, fairly recent examples of, of cartels. Lysine, which is an agricultural additive, citric acid, vitamins A and E. Um, we're going to talk about the vitamin cartel more in the next video. Um, the Lysine <laughs> uh, cartel has a great book about it. It's called The Informant uh, by Kurt Eichenwald. I recommend it reading it, but if you don't want to read it, there's a Matt Damon movie where he plays the somewhat witless protagonist um, who ends up being the informant to the FBI about the cartel, but uh, is the one who ends up in jail because he was also embezzling money at the same time. So I guess the lesson is don't become an FBI informant while you're also embezzling money. Um, and so a few things you can see is that, you know, the CR4 was very high for all of these, right? Meaning that, you know, the top four companies controlled most of the market. Um, and so made, that made collusion much easier. Um, four or five participants in the lysine and citric acid cartels, three in the vitamin uh, cartel, mostly hom homogenous products and steady annual growth. So no demand fluctuation. So it makes sense that these were... Um, easier to um, form successful cartels in these industries. So another successful cartel was the steel industry. So um, this was uh, a big merger in 1901, um, allowed industry concentration. 
Um, and Charles Schwab, who was the president of Carnegie Steel, worked with the leading banker at the time, J.P. Morgan, to consolidate the major U.S. steel companies. So this merger in 1901 um, meant that U.S. Steel controlled 65% of the nation's steel producing capacity. And so Judge Gary, who we already talked about in this um, chapter, wanted to avoid price competition, right? He wanted to um, make sure prices remained high and so profits remained high, um, whereas Schwab wanted more to uh, make sure that they were producing as much as possible, which of course would lower prices. And so Gary became president of U.S. Steel. His position was accepted. Um, and he you know, had these Gary dinners, which we talked about, where he would invite leaders of competing steel producers to dinner um, and basically fix prices, right? Um, and they lasted from 1907 to 1911 uh, and ended just before an antitrust suit was filed. So obviously they, they knew something was coming. Um, and so this was pretty early in the days of antitrust um, cases, right? Uh, keeping in mind the Sherman Antitrust Act was only passed uh, in 1890.